The Football Pod on Off The Ball. In partnership with AIB. Proud sponsors of the GAA Senior Football Championship. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. Hello there and you're very welcome along to episode 17 of The Football Pod. Again, a busy weekend in the Gaelic football calendar. We've got a very busy week ahead of the football pod once more. We're in the Great Southern Hotel in Killarney on Thursday night. Paddy Andrews, you have been flat out this weekend between the Derry Monaghan game on Saturday evening and a doubleheader in Croker today. We're recording this on Sunday night. Are you going to have any energy left on Thursday? Your show based tea, isn't it? That's what it's all about, like. Yeah. Right at the coal face. I'm in the door from Croker about two minutes. I haven't even had anything to eat. Things I'm doing for the football pad. I have to say. Jeez. I'll be knackered. I'm you the only be. fresh one. Between you you working, Tommy flying around Europe. I'm I'm resting up yeah, for geez. Thursday. I'm Tommy's the only fresh one. Inter island air through Europe before he gets <laughs> yeah. to learn. Exactly. Where are you tonight, T? The pod the pod is coming from Rome tonight, lads. Oh, and, oh. The eternal city. Yeah. Phenomenal. We're, we're very lucky it's coming from Rome as well because uh she for booked these flights for my birthday a couple of weeks ago. So I, you typically, I'd be the one, you know, looking after the passports and stuff. And didn't she turn around to me in the airport and say, "You brought the passports, didn't you?" I got the passport. Oh, thankfully, oh, thankfully, Shannon, us. thankfully Shannon isn't too far uh, from the house, so we got there two minutes to spare. So we got there, and uh, James Dunne, you said you had to feed. The pilot up this week. was the fu- the pilot was a football pad fan, wasn't it? Just let thankfully, you on. Thankfully, yeah. I was saying we're in uh, Healy Park last night and in Croker for the day today. The football pod is trending, lads. A lot of people coming up. A lot of, a lot of dairy fans saying we need to give them more credit. I was okay. getting that a lot in all my yesterday. I think we've been pretty complimentary of dairy. For we'd sure. be complimentary Here's... tonight because they were yeah. good yesterday. A lot of Mon- Monaghan fans giving out. I said, like, you've no right to give out, lads. You're absolutely <laughs> atrocious yesterday. <laughs> but, um, but now people are tuning in. They're tuning in. And do you know what, lads? They're pretty good games this weekend. Yeah. Definitely in Croker, better than I thought they would be, I have to say. Yeah, you can see the demand for football at the minute is, is very high. Um, the games have been good. They're coming thick and fast. James, you were perched on the couch for much of this weekend. What did you enjoy? <laughs> I was. I I gave good attention now to the to the Down Armagh game. Okay. Uh, um, just to see what the story was there. Obviously looking forward to seeing Laverty and see how he set up his team. Bit disappointed with them, you know they didn't um, they didn't set the world alight like I thought they might. Um, bit short up front, but Armagh looked Armagh looked championship ready, which I was impressed with. Back to their roots, as Paddy's been saying over the last couple of weeks. You know they showed a bit of their DNA, kicking the ball, tackling. You know they have this dirty, nasty side to them in a good way. You know physically imposing, and their attitude was spot on, which will often get you through a lot of those. You know, early championship games when you're playing a team from the lower divisions. Once your attitude is right, your tackling is on point, and you're playing the right way, you'll get over them. And they scored some unbelievable scores, great goals, uh, and just all around attacking play, which was just very enjoyable to watch. I'd be I'd be looking out for a man from now on. I wouldn't I wouldn't be calling that Ulster final too quickly. It's going to be very it's close. That's going to be a great game, though, lads. Derry and Armagh, by far and away the two standout teams in Ulster. Um, They've gone the way you'd expect the both teams to come through their semi-finals over the weekend. Derry were really comprehensive last night. We said for them to move to the next level and to be genuine all Ireland contenders, they needed that little bit more spark up front. And they looked very good last night. Monaghan made it easy for them. But Armagh getting back to what they do best and Derry motoring very well. What an Ulster final that's going to be on the 14th of May. Looking forward to that one. You know, th- this weekend, it actually, I think it might be the end of the blanket defence. I think that this weekend just put a nail in its coffin because everyone now can pick their way around the blanket defence. They can pi- they can be patient, work it around, work it around, pick a week. Those weren't too defense. hot at it today, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they probably struggled true, true, more than anyone this weekend. Yeah. I know, but if, yeah. It, yeah it's, we'll it's, get to that. It has we'll its limitations, that. doesn't it? Like, like it you're, does. It'll get you so far. It, you're not going to, we've said this, we're beating this drum, Jimmy. For years, you are not going to win the biggest prizes playing that way. That is just the facts. It's no. not enough. It, it's it's a good base to have that you can bring that in at mo- different stages and different games. But if that's all you're hanging your hat on, you are you've no chance. No chance. If if Cassidy had a left leg for Derry, he would have had 15 points in yes. the first half. <laughs> Honestly, he picked he up a couple of beauties, the ball. To be fair to him, yeah, he, he kept he getting the ball in the 12 pocket. Yeah. And if he if he if he could show it to the right and swing it over with the left, he would have cleaned up. 
But even today, like Don went ultra defensive and Arma um, uh, knocked out four goals. Hmm. So now two of them were shots drop short, which we'll probably get to because um, it creates absolute pandemonium. But two were, were brilliantly worked goals against a mass defense. Like it, yeah. it doesn't guarantee a low score anymore. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about the Ulster side of the weekend. We're going to do that after the break. I do want to start with Leinster though, because for the first time since I'd say in the last 12 years, Leinster is actually worth talking about a little bit more than oh. Ulster in some ways. That loud Offaly game, Paddy, for anyone listening, yeah. you, you were on co-commentary. <laughs> was that your co-commentary debut? Because I think a lot of people were loving how into the game you were getting. You were kicking every ball. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, it was a great game. Like, I, I have to say, hand on heart, I went into this today into Croke and I thought Loud would win by 10 points and I thought Dublin would win by 20. <laughs> yeah. That's, that was my fear going into the, I'm like, this is going to be a hard sell on GAA go, <laughs> trying to promote these. But to be fair, I was very surprised at how the Loud Offaly game went. It was a brilliant match. Really, like, Offaly came out of the blocks, all guns blazing. Um, I was surprised with Loud at how open they were defensively. I watched Loud against Dublin last month in the National League. Loads of bodies back, trying to frustrate Dublin, and it was not a great watch. Today, they pushed up on Offaly. Now, whether they'll do this in two weeks' time in the last final against Dublin, I don't know. But Offaly, Martin Murphy had them well drilled. Anytime they turned Loud over, it was fast transition. Kick past the ball. I see more kick passing from Offaly today than I've seen in the last 10 years from any team. And it was brilliant to watch. This was It was an exciting game. And they were getting big dividends out of it. They caused Loud all sorts of trouble. And even when Loud had bodies back, Offaly could still punch holes in it. So Offaly were far more impressive than I thought they would be. Um, Loud, on the other side of the things, Kieran Downey. Seven points from play. Wow. Sam oh. Mulroy, who was, who was looking forward to seeing live, he had a bit of a howler for 70 minutes with David Dempsey picking him up. He did a brilliant job on him. And he just looked sluggish. He looked, I know he's not back from injury, the wasn't hammer, himself. Yeah. And then an extra time, he scores five points from play. <laughs> yeah. So it was just, he was able to turn it on. Uh, for Loud, they should have won the game more comfortably. They had the game won, really, in the third quarter. Big men around the mid- midfield. Tommy Durden and Connor Early, to be fair. Were you impressed me. with the two lads? Very impressed. Because, do you know the way, lads? Big lumps. Six yeah. foot five. They're big men. They can get a bit of a bad rep for just being able to feel the ball. But they had such an impact on the game. He scored five points from play between them. They were really impressive. They put a massive squeeze on Offaly's kickouts. And Offaly just looked like they were running out of gas. Like, like loud, to be fair, of all the teams in Division 2, their conditioning was what stood out. That they were really, really fit. And he always felt that that would probably come back to bite, bite Offaly. And it did extra time, really, Offaly. They get a, they get a goal, one of the drop short ones, as Jimmy said. They're so dangerous. That kind of keeps the minute. But loud were full value coming down. That 20 minutes of extra time, the conditioning, and they're just better quality stood out. But it was a brilliant, brilliant match. It, it would have been unbelievable for Offaly to win it from that position. I was. Yeah. I was slightly edging towards Offaly, I must say. But, but I enjoyed the commentary. Yeah, a bit of crackly. Yeah, just I, I enjoyed how into it you were as well. It was it was great. Um, just on Offaly, because I think a lot of the focus last week after they annihilated Mead was on Mead's demise and where they went to. But today Offaly showed just how much they've got right in the last couple of weeks. They, they were lucky in ways against Longford. Longford took the lead with a couple of minutes to go and they turned it around. And I can just show you what a group does when they can pull together like that. Anton Sullivan, an absolute warrior. Like he was just throwing himself about and getting he came off again. and then came back on and he literally couldn't walk. Yeah. He, he's still he's still cramping. He is on the <laughs> yeah. nose at the oh, moment is, and the calf is seized up. Well, Cunningham even go park and he was lying on Jones's road outside. <laughs> Cunningham at half back, Paddy. Like you, you commented at one stage, this man, what is he doing at half back? Yeah. He should be up the pitch outside of the right. And then a couple of minutes later, Barry's in a goal. He was brilliant, and he actually goes back on to Kieran Downey in extra time as well. Yeah. I think that's the one thing for Offaly. They probably should have looked at that change a little bit earlier. Like if they only had, I think, got five points from play at half time. Like <laughs> if you're a manager, you cannot have a forward in the opposing team scoring five points from play in a half. They need to shut him down. But it was it was funny from Loud. Once Downey was kind of shackled mm. by Cunningham, it was Mulroy who stepped up. So, mm. so they complemented each other well. If both of those guys get hot at the same time, along with the midfield. They'll give Dublin a game of it. Um, but I, I was 
surprised at how open they were defensively. Offaly were absolutely targeted. You could see any time they got a turnover or a turn, got a free around the middle, they were looking straight up to bang it in and get one on ones. If if off or if Loud do that in two weeks' time against Dublin, that could be disastrous. But I don't think Mickey Hart is going to fall into that trap. But as a game, as a spectacle, like said, for something you weren't really expecting, it was top class entertainment. Mm. To be fair to them, can I, I ask you? Uh, on, I was Jose. impressed with 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 Mulroy because mm. obviously he wasn't he was he didn't play well in the, in the normal time and you know when so much is expected of you and he's obviously the talisman up front mm. and you can kind of jeez I'm having a mare here or yeah, yeah, yeah. you might think because like, you, you're always harsh you're a harsher critic on yourself as well you're thinking yeah, I'm yeah. really not into this game and every minute that goes by feels like ten minutes you're like I'm not in this game I know how he was slipping off a few balls and all that but to stick with it and yeah. Get have it nail it next time. He dropped one short, but apart from that, everything beautiful scores left and right. Four from play. I thought that showed we did get four from play. I think that just showed the first half great, great time. mental strength. Yeah, to to dig out a performance when it's going against you. It was him because you know, and we were we commented on this during the game. He looked, he didn't look sharp in the first half. He looked tired, and he was do he was doing exactly what you just said. He was forcing shots because he was thinking, I need to be. How am I not scoring here? Yeah. The main man, and he's looking across, and Kieran Downey's shooting the lights out, and that can get into your head. Or like, I need to get a shot off of my next shot, and he's too. He gets blocked down, and then he's a really bad miss in the first half, and it just looked like a guy who wasn't as sharp after coming back from injury, and also he the pressure was kind of getting in on top of him, his decision making. But to be fair, whether he realizes himself, Mickey Hart or Gavin Devlin or whoever has a conversation with him, he does start bringing other players into the game, and then an extra time when the space opens up. He was so so clinical. He, that was realistically that was that was the winning of the game right there. So he'll be a lot better for that game for in two weeks' time. Um, and it's an interesting one now because Dublin, we touch on Dublin Kildare now. Dublin have a lot to work on as well after their game. So that'll be an interesting Leinster final in two weeks' time as well. Definitely. And we we we'll come back to the Dubs Kildare in a moment. I've one last question on the value of a manager like Mickey Hart and what he can yeah. bring because there is pressure. On loud because they have played so well in Division Two, they've beaten Westmead, who there was a bit of talk about after last year. They're coming into this semi-final as favourites. You know they've already guaranteed a place in in Sam Maguire. Things aren't going their way. Like they should have gone yeah. seven points up. That, that miraculous save in the canal end again oh. for loud. Things weren't. Loud fans right. weren't happy. It looked like it was over the line, but we seen the replay. It was not over the line. It wasn't yeah. Joe Sheridan yeah. part two. James, can you talk just about Mickey Hart and what, what he's bringing to a situation like that when things aren't going your way and how a manager can just cool things down, just stick with our plan, lads? 100%. I think that sometimes a manager can actually do more, more damage in that situation. If, if they're not experienced, they haven't been there before, and you're trying to kind of galvanize your team, and if there's any bit of doubt in that room as to what you're saying, you're in trouble. But if you're looking up at Mickey Hart, who's been there time and time again, and, and been through the million results mm. draw, or dogged out unbelievable results in tight conditions like he went in and set them down at half time set them down at, at the end of normal time and they were fine because they knew that they had a leader who'd been there and been there on numerous occasions you know it's like you need that kind of overall calming presence sometimes it might be a presence to rollick you out of it and say lads this is not good enough and that you buy into that. But sometimes it might be a case of we're fine. We have the legs, we have the conditioning, we have the fitness, trust it and we'll be okay. But wh whatever way it was going, you trust Mickey Hart. That's, that's the, the benefit of it. And then you have a calm feeling going out back onto the field. Yeah. That's shown true today. Definitely. It's just a, we said it, the credibility, what Mickey Hart says goes, he's been there, he's done it around the block and what he's done back-to-back -back promotions, really competitive in, in Division 2, and now into a Leinster final as well, because I wouldn't have had them in this bracket. I would have had Westmead above them, but they win that game. There were uh, There's definitely areas they need to work on after today that, that should have been far more comfortable, particularly when, when they get a stranglehold in the third quarter. But the job he's done with that group of players, and they will mm -hmm. hang on every word that he has. And you're right, that little bit of experience, conditioning, and extra time, they control that. Invaluable. And that's, that's what you're getting when you bring in someone like Mickey Hart's icon. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what he, if, you're, if he comes into a dressing room and tells you something, you are buying into that. That's just yeah. the reality of it. And, and that's what the loud lads have done. I remember, I remember being in, in dressing rooms, say, at the kind of the start of for 
combination of teams, both club and county. And we might be playing brilliantly. And you go in and everyone wants to have a say at halftime. Do you know, and everyone's saying, we need to do this, we need to do that, keep doing this, keep doing that. Or you've gone in and you've had a, a nightmare first half. The same, everyone wants to have their say, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. You need to have some sort of a structure and a leader there to say, everyone just sit down, take your minute here, calm down, and let's go at this the right way. And I, that's what the experience of being in that situation constantly does. It gives you the ability to calm fellas down and just go at it properly. Yeah. Yeah, you could really, you could really see that today. Um, and just final word, Noffy as well. I watched back that Mead game, and Mead pressed always the, back to the Royals today, isn't it? Look, Mead, <laughs> Mead, Mead <laughs> pressed the Offaly kick out that day. Offaly were eleven for eleven on their kick out in the first half. They sat back off the Mead kick out and allowed Mead to take the ball. And I think what Offaly's game plan has done, and I know you're saying that blanket defence mightn't work that well, but what Offaly were doing in terms of the kick outs, sitting back and uh, letting teams take them on was impressive. Now, Loud kicked 27 points, so there, that is one way around yeah, doing exactly. that, kicking those points for yeah, distance. We did stats before with Kerry, and it was a case of when you go short from a kickout, how many times you actually get a shot at the posts. And it was like it was like 80% or something crazy. It was like basically four of every five times you get a short kickout, you get a shot at the post off the back of it. So like that's when, when we were trying to decide, do we give up a kickout and make sure they don't go long and win it there? which is the most dangerous. So do you give it to them short or do you say, no, we're going to risk it by going, by letting you go long? Like if they yeah. go short, you're going to get a shot off. So I, 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 I don't think that, that that giving it, leaving them go short, I don't think there's any long-term benefit of that. Well, I think they certainly backed themselves that Mead wouldn't kick them because Mead had seven wides and three drops short in that first half. So it was it was just a, a yeah. bad first half. I so, suppose it was probably Dublin we were doing the stats. <laughs> yeah, there you go. James, you were tasked with watching Dan Armagh today. When news came through that Stephen Cluxon was named to start, were you tempted to switch over to Diego? I did. I flicked over a couple of times just to have a look to see what the story was. No, I know well, the coverage the, on Diego, G- wasn't it, this weekend? It was good. It was yeah. good. No, I must I say. I, must say. Right. Um, I was surprised they played him, but I suppose Desi kind of said in the interview that he started him just in case anything happened to O'Hanlon, so he's still second choice. But, <laughs> I, don't know about that. I, I don't know about that either. Is he, <laughs> he can't be buying more time. Surely he could just say, Cluxon's number one now. Do you know? He's not going to come out and say that either, though. No. Even though, yeah, that is the case. <laughs> I yeah. told you, never believe that from the managers, un- unless it's Glenn Ryan. Well, that was a blatant... <laughs> <laughs> that was a blatant party. And O'Hanlon's probably sitting there listening, going, you lying bastard. <laughs> But no, but no we he looks solid. He looks solid, didn't he? In fairness to clock, he was he good. He, he was good. You know what I mean? And that's from Dublin's perspective. I I was happy that he was in goal because the like, clock has really been brought back for the All Ireland to try and win the All Ireland. And the challenge Dublin are going to face is if they play a Mayo or a Kerry in a quarter final, a semi final, a final, whatever it may be, and the the opposition bring twelve or thirteen players inside the Dublin sixty five. And they're going after the kick out, and there's massive pressure. And it's 80,000 people in Crow Park. As good as David O'Hannon has been, and he has been brilliant for a new guy to come in, he's never experienced that. And you do not want to have Dublin, don't want to be hanging their hat on an inexperienced person in that literally the highest pressure situation there is when you've got Stephen Cluxton sitting on the bench who's done it for two decades. So they brought him back for, for those games, not necessarily today, even though it was a lot tighter than they would have hoped. But if you don't play Cluxton now in these Leinster Championship games, it's very hard to just drop him straight in. And his first game of the season is against Kerry in an honour in semi-final. So I was I was surprised, to be honest, that he didn't start in Port Leach last week. But he came in today. I thought he was excellent. Did every, he missed 145, but his kickouts, his under the high ball, there was just a calmness there. And that's what he brings. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> Desi's probably got himself a little bit of time between O'Han and, and Cluxton, but I think I'd be pretty confident we'd be seeing Cluxton go for the rest of the summer. I think I, I think the goalie thing, you need you need a settled goalie for yeah. the sake of the group even because... For Wasn't that career, the odd thing with Galway last week though, Jimmy? That they made the switch yeah. to... It's just an odd one. Like. Mayo, Mayo did it in all Ireland finals yeah, sorry, with sorry. Clark and Henley. But even in the Kerry scene, we had Brian Kelly, we had Brendan Keeley, Shane Murphy and Shane Ryan. So four top-class goalies, but it was never certain, certain who was 
number one. It was maybe for the majority, but at, there was still always a fight for it. Mm. And like goalies can be queer hawks. <laughs> like, you know, they yeah, need a bit of love. Yeah. They need to know who's number one at times as well. So I think that, that Desi needs to nail down that number one spot and just give give that person the reins off you go to it. Whoever it is, just go to it from now. It, it might be different when we're talking about Stephen Cluxton because he's Stephen Cluxton. But for the Galway one, if you've got two keepers, and I think it was similar with Henley and Clark, if you have two keepers with different skill sets, like, are we are we making too big of a thing about starting places? Like, we look at players coming in off the I bench. Think, and I think goalkeepers are different though, T. I agree with you, Ames. Still, yeah. Yeah, I, I understand horses for courses out the pitch, but in mm. goal, oh, I, I just, I don't like seeing flip-flopping between goalkeepers between championship games. I think it's the one position you want to have that nailed down and as secure. The full back line know what's happening. The yeah. midfielders know what's happening with kickouts. It's just nailed down. Rotation in the other positions, 100%, because different teams present different challenges. But in nets, dicey if you're going down that road. And that's what was surprising with Galway last week. And it, look, it, it didn't really work for him because their kickouts were was common nailed Galway on the kickouts. So yeah, I don't think Desi Farrell is going to go down the road of, of bringing in and out Stephen Cluxton and David O'Hanlon for the rest of the summer. I think today confirms Cluxton's back. There's no drop off from his performance, which is the positive thing for, for Dublin. Um, and I think that'll be that for the rest of the season. Okay. Um, what happened, Paddy? Today, because we didn't see that performance coming a from Kildare, no, at all. Yeah, like Kildare. First off, credit to them because they made it very difficult for Dublin. Like we seen Kildare in the league, they had no defensive system. They weren't great up front either, and it didn't even look like they were trying to work on something at either end of the pitch. It was just a mess. Now they get a couple of results at the end of the league, obviously beating uh, Mead and Newbridge on the final day, secured their status in Division Two, but that was their best. Performance, most organised performance, highest intensity in their performance by a country mile but this season. Not even this season. season. Not even this season. Against Dublin over the last number of years is probably oh, one of their best performances. So why was they different? Today they were just well organised. We thought maybe it might just be for the first quarter because remember last year's Leinster final, Dublin had five goals on the board by the time the first quarter is finished. Clare weren't going to let that happen, but they kept that in place for for the entire game. That frustrated Dublin, but on Dublin's side, it was back to Dublin that we seen in the second half in Celtic Park when they lost to Derry. Really, really slow in their attack. Yeah. Not being direct. They were wasteful up front as well. I think the three three balls dropped short in the first half. Mannion, Fenton, I think Lee Gannon as well. It was just Dublin were a little bit off up front and they were really passive in their attack. And we said that Look, at any time Dublin play like that, they're, they're vulnerable. That's just the reality of it. When they're direct and when they have penetration in their attack, they're as good as anyone in the country. And we just weren't seeing that at all. And I think the other side as well, in defence, sloppy in their tackling. Like Paddy Woodgate, Jack Robinson, giving Kildare scoreable frees, taking the game, keeping the scoreboard taken over from Kildare. So... It wasn't just that their attack was a little bit slow, a little bit sloppy. I think defensively, they'll be disappointed with just giving away cheap, cheap freeze. So good from Kildare, really good from Kildare. But Dublin, a mm, lot to work on. And that, that attack that attack needs pace, needs directness. And we weren't seeing the first half in particular. We were not seeing that at all. Yeah, well. I think, I think the thing with Dublin, if you look at the National League final, they got, they got four or six, right, which is... Four goals are great, but it's ten scores. Yeah, like you'd be you'd be expecting Dublin to kick 17, 18 scores. Do you know what I mean? Minimum on a bad day, mm. like and they're missing chances, but they're not creating at the rate that they usually do. Well, they went out it's and very, scored. It's it, four thirty the next day, but are you discounting that because it's against the? No, I'm not day. discounting it, but they would never fail to score the fifteen or sixteen. You know, in their pump four mm. six. Against Derry, you know, to only score six points in Crow Park. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like that's that that does show. Even though they won the game comfortably in the end, it does show that maybe it needs something to work on. I'm just saying that this might need a bit of work for them. Same say they got 14. They they probably left a few out there, but it does show that their attack is definitely not as fluid. It doesn't look like they have the creativity or the the creative spark. It's very kind of you know what they're going to do. They're not throwing in enough kind of but randomness into their attack. It's very kind of. I agree, Jimmy. Their, their first half was very like that. Their yeah. first half was very like that. Um, 
they're aware of this because you could see the the reaction they had after that game up in Celtic Park. The following week they played Mead, the league final. They were going direct. They were kick passing the ball. They were keeping Conor Callaghan inside. They seem to go away from that a little bit today. And I can understand it because Galair 15 bodies back inside their 45. Mm. It doesn't lend itself to being really, really direct. And that's why the introduction of Jack McCaffrey at halftime, like pace, real yeah. pace. James McCarthy starts driving at it as well. Carmel Costello, surprising not to see him start. Mm. That left Con O'Callaghan on the freeze. Con O'Callaghan, Con O'Callaghan can do a million things, but I wouldn't say he's the best retaker in the country. No. You know, so not having Costello or Rock in that regard, it was interesting to see that. Mark mentioned uh, that on commentary, you know, missing Rock. He felt it was noticeable today that you didn't have that sure free-taker on the well, <laughs> Lads, we're, Dublin are looking at all Ireland. If you're going to win this thing, there are going to be unbelievably tight games, quarter-final, semi-final, final. You need an absolute nailed-on free-taker. Look at Shawnee Shea last year against in the semi-final. That's something you need to keep an eye on with Dublin, but... They have it in the locker. They know they need to be more direct. But I agree, A, their first half. I think it's a good position for them to be in, that they've won the game and they know they have serious work to do. Because Loud, I expect, will be a little bit more solid than they were today against Offaly in the Leinster final in two weeks. And they'll ask those questions again. Um, But Dublin, just a little... There wasn't enough pace in their play. They weren't moving the ball quickly enough. And I agree with James. Their execution, like Fenton misses a couple of shots... Uh, Mannion, he gets three points from play, but misses a couple uncharacteristically. Dublin need to start nailing those, particularly as we get into the All Ireland series. Yeah, they so had a few th- breakaways even that they that they took strange um, decisions for shots. Um, what the, the centre back Keen Murphy, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, he got a brilliant score. He got then... he got a great score, but he took another one on, the, <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. off balance. You know, like the confidence was up after the one went over. Yeah. The and Lee Gannon threw an outside of the boot at one. Like it's same it's, thing. They yeah. got two, they got scores. They got two great scores each, and then they're like, "Right, I'll have another go here." And yeah, they were the, not good. The, the Gannon one in particular, I thought was, yeah, sixty nine minute. It's yeah. a one point game. Surprising you've kept decision. The, you've kept yeah. the ball. Kalera obviously missed that the will, two. That will be pulled up without a yeah. doubt. But <laughs> well, I think that that was the not fact the right thing. Kildare, Kildare are the Spurs of the GA like. Because <laughs> they had, they had, they oh, had that, that is game. harsh of all oh. the put downs. That is cold. That's exactly what they are. They were Spurs. they were Spursy. had that game in their hand. Just like today, the, the Spurs Liverpool game. They had the result, just see it out. They couldn't do it. Because McCormack had three shots at the post to almost to win it. If if he got two of them, they'd have he'd have got them over the line. I have three to shots. Say, Cribben on had point, one. I'm yeah, and they took it. off. We'll have what? a chat with our guest on Thursday night in Killarney. Mark Mar- O'Shea <laughs> awarded man of the match to Ben McCormick today. If I if I was playing a match and I had four balls dropped short, I don't know if we get in the crystal at the end of the game. But Mark, Mark must have seen something different. Uh, we'll have a chat with him on Thursday night in Killarney about it. Be fair. I do think he is he is an excellent player, McCormick. I have great time for me. He's he plays good. that he was line trouble. really yeah. well. Yeah, he plays the 40. He actually makes... Makes the centre back mark him, which which actually completely upsets the defence. He got loads of out balls. He had a great battle with Small. He had a yeah, great battle with John Small. And he was causing trouble. But he took two shots with the left that, that weren't down for him and just dropped him short. And Cribben had a shot. Yeah. And they were just draining moments. That they even got one or two but, of them worked a better shot, they'd have seen out the game. That possibly shows just where Calera are at. McCormick was speaking after the game. Mark put, obviously put him up for interview. Felt sorry for him having to do an interview after the game. He, he seemed a bit upset that Kildare didn't get over the line. But he said, last year, there was a bit of hype about us and a, you know, a bit of bullshit. This year, we kind of focused on ourselves over the last couple of weeks and getting ourselves right. So then Ryan was saying afterwards, they don't want the pats on the back. But maybe Kildare just shows the limitations of where they're at, that in that crunch time in the last seven or eight minutes, those decisions just weren't. It wasn't even the decisions. It just looked like they didn't have it in the legs to get but it see, in there. That's, that's what we're talking about. They're talking about the very, 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 very best team, the top, top teams, they'll work a score there. They'll get it to the key shooter. That's just experience. That's what separates the top teams from lower down. And Kildare are not at that level. Yeah. They're not. They were hanging on in Division 2 to stay up. So yeah. today was, and I know it's not nice to hear it for, for Kildare because they've lost the game, but there were massive positives from where they were. Like, like People were arriving the Crow Park today. There wasn't a big Kildare following there. People no. were expecting them to get absolutely pumped. 
And to be fair, if they bring that organization, that intensity, and you look at Kildare's bench, like even the, the spot that was on Dublin's bench because of littered with all stars, but Kildare, Feely, Cribben, Daniel Flynn, you know, there's depth on the Kildare bench as well. Highland. Kildare bench as well. Jimmy Hoy, Neil Ryan comes on. Yeah. Um, Kildare have depth there as well. So there, there's a lot of positives to take from it. They're frustrated at losing the game. I accept that. But those things you're talking about, if they're a little bit more clinical up front or if they manage the game better, that's what separates. They're not a top team. No. If they want you're only as good as your conversion, 100%. Yeah. They did the same, Paddy, against Mayo last year in the round before the uh, quarterfinal. Uh, well, the they, had yeah. they had Mayo, they had Mayo played all day. Yeah. And they kicked shots from the sideline. They kicked shots from the corners. Gave Mayo back the ball by dropping a short and ended up losing it. So it, it is it is a bit of a trend that they need to work on that late in games when they're tired, just work on getting it to the top of the day. Get one point in the same space of time as it takes to kick three wides. Do you know, waste a bit of time with the ball and get the right shot rather than giving it back to the opposition three times. Yeah. Just something. I have, I have um, sympathy for managers, a newfound sympathy for managers having to do uh, interviews straight after the game. Mentioned it last week how we were left waiting for 50 minutes in the hide. Joyce has a shower and he takes his time and he comes back out yeah. and he kind of has the liberty to do it. But with the TV interviews, it's straight away afterwards. Uh, there was a flash point, based, isn't it? Flash point in the 53rd minute when uh, <laughs> you could see Dermot Early, Anthony Rainbow and Glenn Ryan going nuts at Darren Daly, telling them to get out of their area um, back over to their sideline. Daly kind of walked away smirking. Um, that was at a time when the game was in the melting pot. And afterwards, Glenn Ryan... Now, this wasn't the only thing he was saying. He was disappointed that Kildare didn't get over the line. Um, but he said, you can say it's sour grapes, but I know I'm reflecting the views of most teams around the country. Everything is laid out up here from a familiarity perspective, from a games perspective, and everything seems to go their way as well. He mentioned the sideline. He mentioned the dressing room. Um, What's the dressing room? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But it, it was a, a heated, probably, uh, moment from Ryan. Now, I will say that the conversation has been well worn at this stage about the dubs in Crow Park for the last 10 years and probably the value of having Leinster semi-finals when it's relatively soulless in there. I think Kildare have probably borne the brunt of it more than most over the last decade. The one thing I'd say, I, I do not think those games should have been in Crow Park today. No chance. Dublin Kildare should have been in Port Leash and awfully loud should have been in Navin. Mm. They were brilliant games. They would have been, imagine, packed houses. So Crow Park with 30,000 were there. And that was for four teams. So I agree with Glenn Ryan in that regard. Those games should be moved out. That's not Dublin's fault. If there's one team where that shouldn't really impact, Kildare have played. How many times have Kildare played in Crow Park? Yeah. The next they have played it's not a there. case of Kildare are not familiar with Crow Park. So we don't buy that. The I, dogs are extra familiar though. Okay. Okay. But I wonder... I, I think that's fair comment. Managers, a lot of managers don't say anything unless it's for... A reason so is he saying that as a pure calculated comment or is it that completely did not the moment come across the as calculated it didn't that's that's, no, what, that's my thinking sense. why did he say it? what's the what he, was the bigger he, picture for him i just don't know what he's getting what he's getting from it pissed off for losing the game it was mm. a brilliant performance from till there and they feel and yeah. they had chances to win the game so there's disappointment in that regard if they got they hammered, hammered, hated, i, I, I see was, it as a detraction but they didn't. They just like if if they got hammered, you could say, well, right, you know what? He's sending a smoke screen there to try and take the pressure off everyone. But I mean, they only lost by two points, so there was no reason to throw that bomb in. It's just for Jimmy to frustrate because they lost a tight game. Yeah. So, and this was like literally ninety seconds, maybe after the final whistle. Yeah. The emotions are running high. I I think I was sitting right behind where the Clare um, management team were. There was a lot going on in their sideline, is what I would say. The the four big personalities there, four legends and Glenn Ryan and a couple of the guys were getting involved with everything and I'm just thinking I never like to see that from managers on the sideline where they're getting involved in the crowd, the bench, the linesman, the referee. You need to focus on what's happening on the pitch. How do I turn this around for my team? I, I don't like he's, well, Davy Fitzgerald is the obvious example on the hurling side of things. It's a bit different for hurling. It's a bit mental but I just thought it was a bit mental around the sideline, looking at it. I was surprised to see it like that. Um, what about uh, what about our boy up north? Rory, yeah. well, to be fair, Sean Hurston goes off and gives him a yellow card. After <laughs> I, I wouldn't have given him a yellow just in case he tore my head off at that stage. Uh, but it was the lads, it was he Hale, had Haley Park was Haley Park was packed <laughs> last night, full house. 
and we were uh, we were set up on the far side of the pitch, and we could hear Rory Gallagher for the first five minutes until he gets that yellow card. Over fifteen thousand people. It's uh, he's he's all action. He's quieting down after that as well. Well, he had a stare I just, in his eye at that time. I that don't. I, I, I don't think it's great for managers. Some teams like it. It works for some people. It works for some players. But for, for Glenn Ryan today, okay, he might feel aggrieved with Dublin having a dressing room. I, uh, I think there's, there's more important things for him to be looking at than that. Do you know what I mean? But I understand he's frustrated at the final whistle. Emotions are running high. Um, I didn't agree with pretty much all he was saying, but fair enough. Yeah, I I think that the Kildare will be will be fairly happy because they were going in there with serious doubts about where they were. They weren't sure. They, they even in the dressing room they would say we could get a hiding here again. They weren't yeah. sure. They ground out a good result. They have things to work on. And as well, when that game was a draw between Offaly and Loud, they were to kick a ball away from being in the Cup. In the Tatting Cup. So I wonder. I wonder did that galvanise them even a bit more? It, it probably I don't know. took a bit. Of, it probably took a bit of pressure off them going into Dublin game. Do you know? That they didn't have to have to win, it just took a little bit of the edge off. But, but when you, they actually do take a step back, they can say, do "You know what? Today wasn't that bad a day for us. Yeah, We're still there. 100%. We've we've actually laid down a, a base point now of where we are, and we can grow from here." So when they actually look at, it, I think they're okay. They, they've three weeks until they play in the All Ireland series. Three good weeks. They've no injuries today. There's there's a basis of a really effective game plan there. Yeah. Get that defensive solidity back. Carry that into the All Ireland series, whatever group they're in. The intensity they were really they were all over Dublin today, so they have the fitness there, and then they have they have Stardust up front. They've guys that can score. They, they do. You pull all of that together, and they will be a handful for any team they play in the All Ireland series. The challenge for Kildare is that's the first time we've seen anything remotely like that from them in twelve months. Do they go into the All Ireland series now and show us what they did through the spring? Because then they've got no chance. But today, <laughs> like Glen Ryan, I understand they're frustrated because it's a tight game they've lost. But when they review that, there are serious positives to take care of. Because I agree, Jimmy. Definitely. We were all thinking going to Crow Park, this is a bloodbath. And I'm sure that might have crept in somewhere along the line with Kildare as well. But that was a, that was a good performance from them today. Yeah, no, it certainly was. And uh, Glenn, whenever the round robin fixtures are announced and every county in the country has one home game one away game and one neutral game and the Dubs get two home games I'll pick up the Canfie again and start complaining about that one more time well, is Newbridge being redeveloped now? Uh, it is isn't it? so Claire's home match would be in Crow Park for it'll probably be neutral oh maybe maybe they will go yeah, yeah. out to go they play in Crow Park, Park as much as the Dubs eh? they probably do they probably do okay what so are they doing to, to Newbridge? they're getting a redone Bend? redeveloped complete, uh, that complete area that well, is it? I think the ground itself, that area... That Probably needed a lick of paint. else <laughs> <Conlon's part. laughs> It had character, Paddy. It, it definitely had character. It had character, yeah. That's a good way. You're like an estate agent there. This place has character. <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, we're going to be back after the break and we're going to talk about Armagh 410, down 12 points. Uh, Derry's big win against Monaghan. We've already covered the Leinster Football Championship. It was nice to give Leinster a bit of love. Um, it's been a, been a long Ready time coming. I don't know if it's back. I don't know if it's back now. And we'll also have a look at, um, I suppose the the way the seeds are looking ahead of the All Ireland Round Robin series and the Thatch and Cup series because the draw is going to be made on Tuesday with a particular football pod host picking out the balls for uh, <laughs> <laughs> the All Ireland. Who do you want, Kerry Jimmy? Who will I pull Kerry? Let's not. With? Let's not get into that territory. Give us, give us, Ford, Tyro- not, give us Tyrone. Not. Tyrone and Killarney. Yeah. Third seed, then. Who do you want? We don't want, no we don't want Monaghan. Right. I'll put Monaghan in a different Don't give position. us Monaghan. Fourth right. seed, then. Fourth seed is away, is it? New York. I need, like, try and get New York into this draw. <laughs> uh, I'll yeah. sort that. You give us a bit of... Revolute me the cash, right? But Tyro, if, if Tyrone and Clarny would be an incredible occasion. No, that would I'm be sad. Or I'm Mayo and Clarny. I'll sort that. I, it's obviously, they're the two of the toughest games you can get but in terms of an occasion down here Clarny needs it a nice well, big game I tell you so. what Clarny will only bad books now I'm going to give Kildare an awful draw Kerry will only get <laughs> Kerry will only get a Mayo or a Tyrone at home if they get by Clare in the Munster final next weekend so we'll be looking at the Munster and Connor finals after the break as well you are listening to episode 17 of the Football Pod 
with Paddy Andrews and James Donahue. We're back after these. The Football Pod on Off The Ball. In partnership with AIB. Proud sponsors of the GAA Senior Football Championship. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. All right, you're very welcome back to episode 17 of the Football Pod. We're very excited here. We're going to Clarny on Thursday night, lads. Where are, no, let's not share where our pre-show points are going to be. Where are we going post-show? Where are we bringing people post-show? Jimmy's town. Where are we going, Jimmy? Post-show. What time are we out? We'll be out for... Probably 10 o'clock. We'll probably have one or two in, in the Great Southern after, will we? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Like so we Piper, could be out for... Piper walking down to the town then. 450 people behind us. <laughs> Dan Linhan's... My grandfather's bar, savage spot. That's a safe Jimmy spot. Bryan's, Jimmy Bryan's is a nice spot. Reedy's, of course, is a good spot. There's uh, a pub crawl here, isn't there? Like, Tatler Reed. Jack. Pat the Bag, the chairman of the county board, his pub, Tatler Jack. Oh, lads. You've loads of great spots. Yeah, pub it's crawl. the best town in the country. Monte Carlo, I said it. Paddy, you I take to, it I, that's, I had to put Mark Crochet straight. He was saying yesterday, he was driving over and back. I said, Mark, no. You arrange a lift. And cancel cancel classes on Friday morning. Call in sick. <laughs> we are having a few shares. Save school. Yeah. What Poor planning this? from him. He, he didn't know what he, he's like. Well, what's it going to be like? Oh, Mark, you need to have 10 points before you go on here. <laughs> Four points at the interval and then 10 points after. And he'd be right as rain. I think we might have to start moving these road shows to a Friday night. That might be the only way forward. Um, for anyone well, no, who's not making we'll, it. We'll be in the town early on Thursday, will we? If anyone's, yes. if anyone's, if anyone's around. Show's not till... Doors are half six, shows half seven. Doors are half six, Paddy, but you are very loose at your times. I need you in there for a dress rehearsal before five, so don't be to getting too baby. excited. All right, okay. That's good. And we we'll are dress focused. rehearsal in Dan Linehan's. We'll be focused <laughs> and getting ready. We've got a crack and show planned. There's going to be about 500 people there. For anyone who can't make it down to Killarney, the show will be putting it out on Friday night. So you'll get it. You'll get a chance to see most of it on Friday night. There'll be some uncut scenes uh, Actually, it won't be uncut. It'll be some edited scenes probably taken out. Some best. moments will be for the room only. And that's that. So that's the Football Pod Live Thursday night. With thanks to AIB in the Great Southern Hotel. We can't wait for it. And hopefully we'll be around the country as the summer goes on. Because it's going to be a cracking couple of months ahead of football. Okay, lads. Let's have a look at what we've got now in the Ulster final in two weeks' time. We have got Derry Armagh off the back of this weekend. James, you gave us the lowdown on Armagh a little earlier. Can I ask you before we move on to Derry, Paddy mentioned it last week that we started to see signs of Armagh going back to the game plan that we saw last year. Did you see more evidence of that again this this week? Yeah, 100%. Early on, you could tell they were going long and they were going fast with it. Now, whether that was they spotted a weakness in the down full back line um, or whether it's their long-term tactic, I'm not sure. I think it's going to be their tactic going forward because they had Mernon inside. They turbot inside, they'd Reno Neal in and out. I mean, they have ball winners in there. Um, and it looked like Armagh were back to their own DNA. When the Armagh... against Cavan, James, as well. Like, it's yeah, clear they did. They're, they're going back to the future now, to be fair to them. So. I think so. But what, like, I think yeah. that what they were doing during the league is they had some solidity kind of issues that they needed to, to challenge. So they needed to get tight, make sure that they weren't being broken down. And they were holding their football I think for the summer that's the way it looks like it's gone and as soon as this championship has hit they're going with the foot they're going long and they're going to their sharp ball winners and it's it's going to make them very dangerous I, if I was a fullback line player playing against Armagh I would I would be worried because there's a ball going to be going in it just it just creates confusion you don't know what Armagh are going to do from every attack where some teams are so coached to go lateral and go slow, it's easy to defend against. When the ball is coming in quick, if you're half a step off your man, you're caught. So that's that's the absolute lottery of playing it long, and it's going to work for Emma, I think. We spoke about Loud earlier having a couple of threats, and Downey in the first 50 minutes, Mulroy in extra time. We've spoken a lot about Connor Turbot in the first couple mm-hmm. of weeks of championship this year. 15 points. Didn't score today, but Andrew no. Mernon got 1-1. Reen O'Neill gets a goal. Um... Grugan, Duffy chips in, a couple of the backs chip in. What about Shane McPartland? What's he bringing to the table? Because I like that goal he scored. A bit of magic. He has. Magic yeah, he does. Do you know what? He has some serious self-confidence. He's willing to take on the shot. And if he misses, he's going to get back into position to shoot again next time. And he had, he had a shot that went tailed off wide. Then he had 
another one which drops short Let go. For, the, for the goal. And then he he gets into another scoring position for his own goal, which was just brilliant skill, power, pace, and to get the finish off, it was just exceptional play. But if you can have actual scores from midfield like that, we said about the half forward line chipping in home part, and that is to take the pressure off the full forward line. If you're getting goals from midfield and points from play, it's incredible. So, so valuable. And he is a serious addition. Yeah, yeah. We gave down quite a bit of kudos last week for beating Donegal. Some people saw it coming early in the year. How do you think Down will fare in the Talton Cup? I think they'll be dangerous, but the Talton Cup is fairly stacked. I mean, mm. the Talton Cup is not going to be easy at all. Down have a good defensive system going. What they're short is quality up front. They couldn't really um, break our mad down with any bit of regularity. And they had a couple of frees that they dropped short into Rafferty's hands. They had a couple from play the same. And when you don't score a lot anyway, to have that kind of deflation of dropping the ball short, yeah. it really brought them down a couple of notches and it happened regularly. Yeah. So I think that just just the quality wise is something they need to sharpen up on because they're going to be tight at the back. We know the way they're going to play. They're going to build up probably a bit slower than most teams. So when they do pull the trigger, they need a higher conversion rate and they yeah. can't be dropping them short. Yeah, we need to, we'll need to see a next level and progression over the next couple of years, which I'm sure people in Down are expecting that, especially with the under-20 success. Paddy, you've had a close eye on Ulster football over the last couple of weeks. What are you expecting from Derry Armagh? Um, I think the impressive thing for Derry yesterday, they have that defensive solidity we've seen. Cara McManus and Jack McCarran were the latest two star pairing that, that fell foul of, of Chrissy McCaig and Conor McCluskey. Um, so good but he was there was times McManus and you know McManus only needs half a second to get free and McCaig was all over him Definitely. so there you have that we knew they had that the big question mark was can they get more scores don't be overly reliant on Shane McGuigan Shane McGuigan was excellent again yesterday but he'd eaten Darty, Connor Darty, Connor Glass was excellent Cassidy they're getting scores. They have a broader range of scores, which was the next layer to their game. Now, albeit Monaghan were atrocious. Bodies back, not doing anything. No pressure on the ball. But there you were really efficient in attack and a lot slicker, a lot more cohesive up front. Um, so they've seemed to... They knew there was an area to work on. And to date, they were against two poor teams in Fermanagh and Monaghan. They've shown improvements in that. So it's really positive for Rory Gallagher on that side. Armagh, as James has highlighted, absolutely nailed on. They've gone back to what makes them really good. Their USP, fast transitions, kick passing the ball. That's going to cause Derry problems because Derry's blanket defence is not just sitting 15 guys behind the ball. They all attack together as well. And they're seeing there were times where already begging, like they were pushing up on kickouts and begging was trying to launch over the press. So, so Derry take risks in their play. And if they're bringing lots of bodies forward, and our man can turn them over and get that quick transition. They can really, really hurt Derry as well. So I think it's a fascinating game. I think they're the two best teams in Ulster. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And they're both in really good form. Yeah. Our man, the National League, you're saying they've got no chance of winning this game. But they've three wins on the spin. Reno O'Neill is back. Turbot has that confidence. McPartland are finding new players to add to Reno O'Neill. But it's their style of play. They do that. It's a brilliant, brilliant attribute for our man to have. And it looks like they've settled on it. We're going for this. And I think that final, I think it's going to be a brilliant match in two weeks' time. I'd still have Derry ahead. I would, mm. I'd have Derry probably favourites to win that game. But I think it's going to be one of the standout games of the summer. Yeah, it's a so savage with the, match. With the, with the going long, lads, what, in terms of defending against it, it kind of... It makes you play your hand defensively if a team is going long or even has the threat of going long. Because... If Armagh line up with Turbot and Mernon, say, in the full forward line, or Reno O'Neill and Mernon, two ball winners inside, then Derry Sweeper is going to have to be right bang close to them on the almost on the penalty spot or the edge of the D. Whereas if you're constantly running the ball, that sweeper can push out and just create a, a block kind of outside the 45 that you're just never going to get through. So even if you just throw in a few balls long at the start, it make it's going to make Derry defend deeper. And deeper and deeper. And as it goes on, it creates more space. And I think that's what caught down today. They couldn't, they couldn't push that sweeper out to, to stop the waves coming through because they had to drop the sweeper right back in front of the, the Armafel forward line. Because you can't leave a 2v2 from a long ball. It has to be 3v2. 
That's interesting. I find it interesting that Brian Fenton spent quite a bit of the last 15 minutes in the full back line as well. He followed Kevin we had to, in. Claire were putting bodies inside and Fento probably wasn't his best game today, but he was very effective in there because Claire was a couple of balls in. We know how good feel he is in the air. So um, you just have to be, be able to adapt to that. And, yeah. and there's no doubt, like Rory Gallagher even alluded to it yesterday, there he conceded two goals, but another high ball. <laughs> and he's yeah. like, they need to focus on that. So I think it's a fascinating game. It's two of the top teams. Yes. And they're in top form as well. That's that's the key thing. And this is, I think it's a brilliant way to wrap up the provincial championships before we go into the All Ireland series uh, on the 20th and 21st of May. So 100%. oh it's it's well set. And I think that's gonna be I'm looking forward to that one. So this Sunday, we've got Galway Sligo in the Connick final. Sligo promoted from division four to three and Galway who have obviously been impressive over the last couple of weeks. Um, that's going to be in McHale Park, 1.45pm, Sunday, May 7th. James, myself and yourself are going to be at the Gaelic Grounds. That's where the venue is, isn't it? The Gaelic yep. Grounds covering um, Claire and Kerry for off the ball, four Ooh. o'clock throwing. Get me excited for this game. I can't. Sell Come it on. to me, Jimmy. Come on. <laughs> Tell yeah. me this game. I'm not joking. Oh, it will be interesting, I think. Look, Claire have come on leaps and bounds and they had their season defining game already against Cork and then again against Limerick. So they're, they have a free shot here. They're in the group, whether they win the, the monster final or not, it wouldn't have probably been one of their goals to start the year. They had to get into this group to be playing high class opposition constantly. And I, I think Colin Collins even said in an interview that to be playing three top class games in that group and possibly a fourth, if they come third in the group, will bring that group on so much. Mm -hmm. Kerry, on the other hand, obviously gave Tip a good hiding at home in, in Killarney. Tip were, were way off it. You were really um, excited for that game, weren't you? <laughs> I was trying to big up that game, but I couldn't. But I think this game will be tighter, but I think just, the Kerry, Kerry after that warm weather training camp, Tom, yes. that we talk about, I think that they're just on a different level to Clare. Gaelic grounds is wide open. Wide open spaces, they'll be kicking the ball. I think it'll be a high scoring game. I don't know. That's a high I scoring. I don't know. If that's a high scoring game. That's a disaster for Clare. What, what, yeah. Look at what we saw this weekend in Crow Park between Kildare and Dublin. And yeah. Clare and Clare, you can say that the league went certain ways for both of them. Um, Clare would probably back themselves to be possibly a, a more solid outfit in terms of how they set up defensively against Limerick. They retreated quite a bit. And I think they kind of said to Limerick, go on, shoot from distance. And Limerick picked off points uh, that I was surprised by. A lot of points from their backs and midfielders, some savage points. Kerry are going to have no problem shooting from distance if Clare sit back. What do Clare need to do? Um, obviously, they need to get bodies back. But what do they need to do to, to thwart the Kerry attack? Well, I think, I think against a team like Kerry, attack is the best form of defence at times. You have to have the ball. You can't just say, here, have the ball. Attack as much as you want. Yeah, if you and give we'll carry the ball, you're out. Yeah. You need, you need possession. You need to be up the other end of the field. That's the main thing. The second thing on the kick out is they're going to have to do some sort of a press or stop Kerry from chipping a short because, again, that's possession. And then Claire are going to have to have a huge conversion rate. They're going to have to take all their chances, make, make Kerry feel the pressure, put a bit of uncomfortableness into their, into their, into their minds, put a bit of doubt, saying, are we... We are we as good as we thought we were. All those, all those usual questions you have when you're not playing well, they need to put them into the. Into look, Jimmy, but, does Tom O'Sullivan pick up Keelan Sexton and does that put big pressure on Clare's firepower? Will, will we say we'll see that matchup next next Sunday? We'll definitely see that matchup, which is probably a good matchup for Tom in terms of their physique is the same. Sexton's an excellent player, quality yeah. operator, great kicker, goal in him, point from playing him, excellent after freeze. But as we saw in that Monaghan uh, Derry game, there's only one way Tom Sullivan is going to go, and it is up the field, and he's going to bring Sexton with him. So if I was Sexton, I'd be telling my half forward, Harry Tom Tip Sullivan game. is going to go here. You track him, and I'll mark your man. Isn't that the like, key? R Rory Gallagher came over to us last night, and, and we could ask him, was, was this a plan? <laughs> you know, get Colin McManus, get Jack McCarron running back towards the wrong guy. He's like, yeah, 100%. 100% it was. And, we played in full forward lines. Like, whatever way you dress it up, you do not want to be running back to your own goal. You don't want to be inside your own half. You don't want to be inside your own 21 no. trying to make tackles. That is just not your game. Um, 
and you could probably maybe 10 years ago get away with that a little bit because the cornerback was usually shit on the ball. <laughs> They're like, let him have it. He's not going to do anything. Those days are gone. You see <laughs> no how effective, yeah, you see how effective the likes of Thomas Sullivan, Jack McCaffrey, Conor McCluskey, these guys, if you give them the ball, they are going to hurt you. And you're right, like Thomas Sullivan is not going to be standing there inside his own square yeah. beside Keelan Sexton. He's going to be going up the pitch. So, yeah, you need we, to, you better have your weight of that morning. You're going to be working hard, but that's what it's about. That's what Claire are going to have to do if they're going to have any sort of chance in this game next Sunday. We well, I think it's about more than working team. hard, even. Sorry, Tom. I think it's working about, smart. Yeah, pass yes, them on. Because all, I could have all the will in the world to get back and help the boys out in defense. But you'd be useless back there. Be useless, absolutely useless. Same a fella does a little show and go. It's not his game. Yeah, a little show and go. I'm out of the game. Your man's around me. An open space would actually be better because then every, another defender would try and fill that space. Whereas if I'm standing there as a as a corner forward back there, my defense thinks that's okay. That that area is filled, but it's not because it's filled with a corner forward. It, there two, might as well be two weak shoulders. There. Two weak shoulders and they're going for both of them. <laughs> but there, there might as well be nobody there. The only thing you should be doing as a corner forward, really, is is tracking the runner as far as you can and then passing him on and getting Someone who knows what they're doing. Yeah. 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 yeah, and it's get back up the field for an out ball for if there's a turn. going up for a smoke. Well, well look, at, yeah. we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're... Or else, good get at... the cliffy yellow and then you don't go back <laughs> again. On a yellow, lads. There's nothing I can do. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> We're going to be getting into this more in the second part of our road show on Thursday night with Mark O'Shea. And I will add the original attacking cornerback. So we'll see what he has to say about that, Paddy. And we will also be looking at the round robin draws for both the All Ireland Talchin Cup because we will have them on Tuesday. Paddy, I don't want to come to you. We have them here now if you need them. Do you need don't want to come to you yet. <laughs> The sideline interviews that we're seeing post-match, we saw Comer do it with RT, Gallagher did it with yourself Saturday night, Jack McCaffrey stood beside you today. It's a lovely little addition to the covers that we're getting this summer. That's great from GA Gaudo, isn't it? Like? Yeah, they're doing it well. Something else, some platform, like. I, do, I think the players need to be need <laughs> more to be showcased a bit more. Like, you need to see the personalities of the player of who's lining out. I think it, it makes a massive difference. I thought it was brilliant. I, I think it's great. I do. I think anyone watching at home, any young boys or girls watching GAA, mad fans all over the country, they're crying out for access. Mm. I want to hear from these guys. I want to hear from David Clifford. I want to hear from Jack McCaffrey. I want to hear from the best players, the best coaches. Um, like I said, the, the, traditionally, there just hasn't been a will from teams to do that. Like I was in part of a team which was not engaged in this side of things. That's just the reality of it. But when you're on the outside... People want to hear from these guys. They're superstars all over the country, and it's brilliant to see. So hopefully, hopefully we do see this throughout the championship. Because even um, ninety seconds with, with Rory Gallagher last night, same with Jack McCaffrey today. It, it's gold. People want to hear from him. People want to see it. So fair play to the players and coaches for buying in and, and, and giving us their time. Um, and I, you're right. I judging by the feedback, even this weekend with it. I think supporters and people watching at home are loving it as well. So that's what we're trying to do, bring that bit more access uh, to everyone around the country watching it. Yeah, it was super. And I, it doesn't even have to be that much. It's just even hearing Jack McCaffrey, like, why, Gronje McAway and asked him, why did you come back? And he <laughs> straight just, in. straight in, but he, straight away, he's just like, well, I woke up one morning and I felt like I wanted to come back, yeah. text and the lads, the and I've been they working hard since. Yeah. And you could, yeah, there was some really good stuff. Keem Ward as well and yourself for asking him about the physicality of it and, you know, being back. And it's just very interesting to hear that. So, that was all really good. Um, just to run through the seeds that we have, and then we're wrapping it up, lads, because we've got a busy week ahead of us. First eat seeds, something. Fade first, away. The, the draw, the quirk here is that the draw is actually taking place before the provincial finals. So whatever that says about the provincial finals, you tell me. But first seeds or second seeds, go with Sligo, Claire Kerry, Dublin Loud, Armagh Derry. They're confirmed to be first or second seeds. Third seeds, Mayo, Roscommon, Tyrone, Monaghan. Fourth seeds, Donegal, Cork, Kildare, Westmead. Talchon Cup round robin. First seeds are Mead, Cavan, Fermanagh, and Limerick. Second seeds are Down, Offaly, Antrim, Wicklow. Third seeds are Longford, Tip, Leash, and Wexford. And the fourth seeds are Leitrim, Carlow, Waterford, and London. There can be some stacked groups in that Talchon Cup as well. Any last London would be a good weekend, would it? Yeah, we'll have to try and get London in summer. Yeah. We'll, right, we'll okay. go, we'll we need a roach on London. Leave that with me. Leave let's, that get, with me. <laughs> let's get Thursday night out of the way first. No hiccups. Okay. You know, I'm getting prepped now. I'm stressed. I get stressed before these. You look very stressed over in Rome there. Where are you after now? Trevi Fountain, pizza and a Peroni. Going for a pizza and a Peroni. It's a glass of red wine. 
seen you have next to you. <laughs> yeah. I had a red wine a couple of weeks, a couple of hours ago. <laughs> Mark O'Shea given Ben O'Connor man of the match today, or Ben McCormick man of the match today, and you on here <laughs> slurring your words like. <laughs> Professionalism, lads. Who did you? You Fuck had an sake. easy choice. Who did you go? Oh, you went for Downey. Yeah. Uh, Downey was an open goal. He scored a hundred yeah. points from play, like. Open oh, goal. That was very impressive. You know. No, he was. He was full value for it. Yeah. What about the umpire waving uh, for Hawkeye? It was about 10 foot wide at one stage. <laughs> Anton Sullivan's point. Can you go easy on the umpires? Come on. Anton, are you on, a, are you on I, about Anton Sullivan's? I actually on TV... Oh, no, I, that was fine because that was I a thought point. It was This over. one was middle of the post wide. Actually, right. Kenny got a score on the first half for Dublin into the hill. And it was like over the black spot. The umpire yeah, is there like Hawkeye. Well, no, they have a tough job, Jimmy. Now you've you've yeah. gone to town on the poured out umpires before. Now you, maybe you the umpires' job now, realistically, is run out and just do a television box sign, because they don't actually call points and wides anymore. Because they can't, they, they can't commit. Okay, imagine, they imagine, go straight imagine, to imagine what he's going to be like, Tommy, when he's four points in him now on Thursday night. <laughs> I can't wait. Everyone's going to get it. Be worse than Glenn Ryan. <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be serious crack. Uh, really excited for it. The football pod episode seventeen is in the books. Paddy Andrews, well done today. Not easy out there, lads. Busy, well done, busy day. Well done, man. Great stuff. James, fair play to you too. I'm driving Thank down you. to Clarny now, Jimmy. I'll see you in three hours, right? <laughs> looking we'll forward to Thursday night. We'll see you there. And looking forward to seeing everyone who's going to the show as well. We can't wait. We'll see you on Thursday night. Cheers, Cheers boys. Yeah.